This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the first video for Module 5. In this video I want to talk about types of chemical reactions. Remember when it comes to matter, things can be divided into either mixtures or substances, and pure substances can be either compounds or elements. When we're talking about chemical reactions, we are over here on the substance side of this chart. We'll be dealing with compounds and elements and how they work together for a chemical change that we call a chemical reaction. There are five basic types of chemical reactions. Your book only covers the first three, formation, decomposition, and combustion, but I also want to mention single replacement and double replacement reactions because they are ones that we will be using in lab. We've already actually done two of them, and so I wanted you to be familiar with them. A formation reaction, which is also called a synthesis or a combination reaction, is when two or more substances combine to form something new. And this can be written as A plus B, giving us AB as the compound. In this example, an element is added to another element to make a compound, such as when you combine solid magnesium with oxygen by burning it in air to make magnesium oxide. This is what happens over here in this picture, showing the bright burning and the clouds of magnesium oxide smoke up here. This is also what is going on when you burn sparklers for celebration of 4th of July. Formation reactions or synthesis reactions can also happen when an element and a compound combine to make a new compound. So, for example, in our catalytic converters in our cars, carbon monoxide, which is given off from the fuel burning process of, that drives your engine, is combined with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide, which, although it's not a um, healthy gas so far as, as it's a waste product for respiration, it is nowhere near as dangerous as carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is very toxic, and so by using our catalytic converters in the automobiles, we're able to convert, we're able to encourage a synthesis or formation reaction that will turn carbon monoxide into carbon dioxide. And then finally, you can also have two compounds combining to make a more complex compound. This example is when sulfur trioxide, which is a waste product of many pollutants in industry, released into the atmosphere will combine with water to give us sulfuric acid. And this then comes down in the rainfall. Here is a forest that has been devastated by acid rain. This picture over here shows the effect of acid rain on a sculpture over the course of about 60 years. With some of the um, scrubbers and other pollutant reducing mechanisms that, that the federal government has required industry to put into the smokestacks, we have seen a decrease of acid rain in our country, but it still is an issue and in other parts of the world it is becoming more and more of an issue. Next we have decomposition reactions where things decompose. So in this reaction a compound breaks down into two more simpler substances. I see I miss an S here. Um, and so the way of writing that could be that AB breaks down into A and B. Most decomposition reactions require inputs of energy. If you think about this, it makes sense. If they didn't need energy in, things would be decomposing all over the place. But if things are stable in our current temperature range, then they won't be decomposing. Substances may decompose into either elements or other compounds, though I think your book just focuses on decomposing into elements. So for an example, a compound decomposing into its basic elements are when mercury oxide is decomposed into pure mer mercury and oxygen gas. So here we see the mercury oxide in the test tube on the left, and then you can see our flame here adding heat, adding energy, and then the result is this nice, lovely, silvery mercury color that we're familiar with in thermometers, and of course oxygen gas would be filling the test tube here. Not quite as easy to see because it is perfectly invisible. You can also have a compound decomposing into other compounds so that metal carbonates, like calcium carbonate, when heated, will decompose into an oxide, in this case calcium oxide, and carbon dioxide gas. 
This is just the general setup for decomposing a carbonate, a metal carbonate, where you're adding heat. In the laboratory setting, they have Bunsen burners, a little bit more sophisticated method than our alcohol burners, but heat is added to the solid, and then the gas can be collected over here in, in a test tube. Lime water is a test for the presence of carbon dioxide, um, which would really be redundant in the case of the calcium carbonate because lime water, when carbon dioxide is bubbled through it, the carbon dioxide combines with the water to make calcium carbonate, which then becomes a white precipitate. The lime water turns cloudy, and that is an indicator that a metal carbonate is decomposing and carbon dioxide is released. But it seems like you're just going around the circle if you use that for calcium carbonate. In a combustion reaction, the third type of reactions, you have a substance that's reacting with oxygen. And as a result, you get carbon dioxide, water, and of course heat and light, because we're all familiar with heat and light coming off of combustion reactions. Many of our combustion reactions that are used, uh, that occur on purpose, are coming from the burning of a hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbons are used because they give off a lot of heat and energy, and hydrocarbons are the fuels for our um, furnaces and stoves and cars, heavy machinery. Things are all being uh, fueled by hydrocarbons. So the reaction down here that I've written out is, and I see I forgot to shrink my subscripts here. Um, this is propane C3H8 that will combine with oxygen to give us carbon dioxide and water. And if you have a tank for the gas for your stove or you're in, a, um, in your camper, you have a, a propane tank, you have the blue flame of your stove, this is the reaction that is going on causing the flame to heat your food or whatever you're using that propane for. If you're burning natural gas like I am in my house, it's mostly methane, which is a slightly smaller molecule, slightly smaller hydrocarbon. When it comes to combustion, you can have complete and incomplete combustion reactions. In a complete combustion reaction, you have enough oxygen so that carbon dioxide and water are the only products. <clears throat> But in an incomplete combustion reaction, which is really reality in, in ordinary, everyday, burning things in the presence of oxygen in our air supply, <clears throat> the atmosphere, you get carbon dioxide and water, but you also get carbon monoxide because there's not enough oxygen to go around, and you get carbon itself as soot, or if you happen to burn your food, as that stuff that's stuck on the inside of the pan. So incomplete combustion reactions are really more of the rule in ordinary combustion happening with our ordinary atmosphere. In the laboratory, you can make complete combustion happen by adding oxygen or making sure you're having an oxygen-rich environment for when that combustion occurs. And then finally, moving on to our replacement reactions. In a single replacement reaction, one element replaces another element in a compound. So you have A plus the compound BC turns into the compound AC plus B. We saw this in the reaction in lab where aluminum foil was added to a copper chloride solution and the copper came out. We saw solid bits of copper appearing like you see down in this beaker below and in solution then there would be aluminum chloride for as much of aluminum foil we had to replace the copper. So that this reaction you just have a substitution of one element going in to replace for another. In a double replacement reaction, you have a switcheroo where the positive and negative ions of an ionic compound exchange places to form two new compounds. And this also we did in lab where we combined potassium iodide with lead nitrate and got this beautiful yellow precipitate, which is the lead iodide, and then there was potassium nitrate in solution. So in this case, you can see that the potassium and iodide here is, each of those has found a new partner, potassium's gone with the nitrate, and the lead and iodine have hooked up. So it's a double replacement, not just a single. 
So that covers what I want to say about the five main types of chemical reactions. Be watching for these different types as we move forward into this course and, and start working more with chemical compounds and thinking more specifically about what is happening in these experiences we have in lab.